Chess enthusiasts, The King's Gambit was one of the most popular openings for over 300 years and has been played by many of the strongest players in many of the greatest brilliancies. One such player is Adolf Anderson, famous for his marvelous sacrificial attacking play. There are 90 games in my database where he's played The King's Gambit, more games than some of you watching have even played, and here are 5 times he defeated the world's strongest chess masters with this opening. The first game was played in Berlin in 1864 and his opponent was Hermes Scala. Sure enough, it starts e4, e5, and f4 marking the king's gambit where white offers the f-pawn to gain a foothold over the center. In the same vein, black responds e5, the Falkbeer counter gambit. Just as an illustration, if white takes on e5, the game would be over and done with before we know it as black would pick up the rook. Nowadays, the most common response to this counter gambit is capturing on d5, but Anderson opts for this line where he gets a strong knight along with some pressure on f7 after bishop c4. Black should play knight h6 to defend and prepare to castle. He takes on e5 instead, which is still fine, and after the recapture comes up with queen d4, which wins a pawn. However, we're 7 moves in and black's queen is his only participating piece. D4 is a nice move, luring the queen forward where it soon becomes a target for white's bishop. Queen e5 is best, getting off the d-file, but queen d8 is played, essentially asking white to play more developing moves with tempo. First white castles, black should follow suit, but plays h6, possibly afraid of a bishop g5 pin. Now Anderson gives us an enlightening demonstration of how to take advantage of such a huge lead in development. Bishop c5 stops black from castling, then knight b to d7 is the response. White has a couple wins here, but one move is by far the strongest. See if you can find it. The move played is queen takes e4 and black resigns, since checkmate is unstoppable. Of course, black could give away tons of material to delay it, but a nice end to this game would involve accepting the queen sacrifice, after which bishop takes f7 is checkmate. This next game was played in London in 1851 and the opponent was Johann Leventhal. In this game, the gambit is accepted and Anderson chooses to continue with bishop c4 known as the bishop's gambit. White is going to allow queen h4 check, arguing that he can take advantage of its vulnerable placement. Black first plays of all moves b5, and boy do I wish people played like this nowadays. This is the Kizaritsky gambit and it deflects the bishop away from the center. Then queen h4 check comes, stealing white's ability to castle. Now black should develop his kingside, knight f6 to g4 being a strong plan. Instead black plays g5, and the players may as well have been throwing punches with how this game is going. Both sides develop their pieces, then we start to see white take advantage of the offside queen. Knight f3 develops with tempo, and is followed by h4. The pawn shouldn't be taken because it gives white loads of activity h6 is played. Now the h-pawn is pinned, so white can't resolve the tension just yet. He continues e5, gaining space in the center, and black sees this as an opportunity to jump forward with the knight. This looks threatening. However, white plays king g1 to meet the threat and simultaneously unpin the rook. Knight g3 is followed by rook h2, and white doesn't really have any issues. The h-file is about to be opened, so black has to deal with that. Best is queen g4 so that if ever the knight moves, black can exchange queens. g4 wouldn't work because white would win a pawn. In the game, black plays queen g6 and things go south quickly. Knight d5 threatens a fork, so that's stopped. Then the h-file is ripped open, the rooks are exchanged, and after the dust settles, white finds a fantastic tactic. Knight takes g5, meeting queen takes g5 with bishop takes f4. In the end, black's queen is deflected away from the defense of h5, allowing white's queen to come in with a bang. Queen g7 seemingly defends both threats, but oops. Black resigns because he would have to give away everything to stop checkmate, and even then, there is still checkmate. Game 3 was played in Berlin in 1866 and the opponent was Gustav Neumann. It features the most common continuation in the king's gambit with knight f3 and g5. Two bishops come out, then h4 is not met with g4 because the knight would go to g5 and there's immense pressure. h6 is the best response. White thrusts forward with d4, we see some more development, 
A knight e2 is an interesting move, the idea being to play c3 or as seen in the game, put the bishop on c3. Black continues with queen e7 attacking e4 and queen d3 defends the pawn. Soon it becomes clear that both sides intend to castle queenside, black doing so right away. White plays bishop c3 contesting the long diagonal and black puts additional pressure on the e4 pawn. White does not actually have to defend the pawn. He could queenside castle and I'll jump through the moves pretty quickly here. The black kingside pawns are extremely vulnerable, so if the pawn is captured, the game could simplify into an equal endgame. This is how the engine would play this position, but Anderson wants blood. Exchanging queens would not be the way. d5 is played. Knight to e5, white captures a knight, and here is where black slips up. The best way to recapture is with the bishop, but black captures with the pawn. This opens up later opportunities for bishop e4 attacking the queen, and even d6 opening up the queen side. White castles long, then plays a3 with bishop e4 in mind. Now the threat of bishop e4 must be taken seriously because the queen is very short on squares. Black should continue with either queen d6 or queen c5 so that the queen doesn't get forced out of the game. Instead, knight g4 jumping in with the knight and planning to meet bishop e4 with queen f6. Bishop c5 cuts out the knight's advances and black decides to play b6 to deflect the bishop away. However, this last move is incredibly weakening. Bishop a6 check. Either way the king goes, the response would be the same d6. Black has one good reply. He can't take the bishop because checkmate can't be stopped. Taking the pawn also leads to checkmate. So c6 keeping the position close. White shifts the queen to b3 lining up a bishop sacrifice on g6. Black has to defend with queen d8 immediately but decides to throw in bishop e6 first. The problem with this is that the d-pawn is not blockaded anymore d7. If the bishop takes, then white would sacrifice the exchange, attack the queen, and it wouldn't be able to leave the second rank because of the bishop sacrifice on g6. Yet, queen c7 would be met with bishop d6. So black saves his rook, and can you find the winning move? Anderson plays bishop e7, and the queen is trapped. Black resigns. The penultimate game was played in Berlin in 1851 and the opponent was Jean Dufresne, no relation to Andy Dufresne, the fugitive at large who escaped Shawshank State Penitentiary. In this game, we see bishop c5 which is the classical variation of the king's gambit decline. If you've been paying attention, you know that white cannot take on e5 because of the devastating queen h4 check. Naturally, knight f3 is played. d6 and c3 intending to grab the center with d4. Bishop g4 pins the knight, stopping that plan, then both sides prepare to castle. However, white is given the chance to clarify the situation in the center. White takes on e5, and black should not recapture because of this nice sequence, winning two pawns. Knight takes e4 wouldn't be good either because white would get a huge center. So black is forced to trade the bishop before recapturing on e5. Now white has some indirect pressure on f7. d4 is played to move the black e-pawn out of the way. The immediate e5 is possible, but black would just play queen e7. So first white castles walking into pawn takes c3 discovered check. Black doesn't want to take on b2 because it would give white too much activity. He goes for queen d4. The bishop gives check on b5, and instead of saving his bishop, Anderson plays knight takes c3. The idea is that once the bishop is captured, white plays e5 hitting both the knight and the b7 pawn which if captured would win the rook. Black castles so that the rook can be defended with a knight move, and white wins back the piece. Then bishop f4 develops while avoiding a queen exchange. Black is up two pawns so he insists, and needless to say, white declines again. Now this last move has a couple threats. Rook c1 would pin the bishop who's already attacked once. And if the bishop were to move off the diagonal, then bishop d6 would win the exchange because the f7 pawn is under attack. Bishop e7 would be the only way to defend everything. Instead, black plays knight d7 and things begin to fall apart. Rook a to c1 creates the pin, b6, then bishop d6. Black's best option is queen d5 getting out of the pin and giving up the exchange. Instead, king h8 is played, which 
is a terrible move because it stops absolutely nothing. White takes the exchange, then plays b4 attacking the pinned piece. The game continues a few moves, and after queen h3, black resigns since white will soon be up a rook. Finally, if you made it this far, then lucky you. I saved the best for last. This was played in Berlin in 1865 and the opponent is once again Emil Scala. It follows the third game up until move 4 when white strikes with the immediate h4. This is met by g4. In this position, there is this insane gambit beginning with knight g5, where white sacrifices the knight. This could be a topic for another video. But in this game, Anderson chooses a calmer move, knight e5. Shocking. Black attacks the knight and white picks up the g-pawn. Then d5. White cannot capture the pawn because of the crushing queen e7, winning a piece. King f2 would also lose to bishop d4. So white defends with knight f2. Black captures. Then some development before black castles and Anderson is now salivating at the prospect of an attack on the already ruined king side. White plays d3 opening up the dark squared bishop and preemptively defending the knight in anticipation of rook e8. Bishop e2 breaks the pin on the knight, then we have an instructive moment. Right now there isn't yet a strong kingside attack. Black has two pieces actively defending the king and white has at most three of their own ready for an attack. Black plays knight d5, prompting some exchanges. However, now there is one less defensive piece, and after bishop takes f4, one new piece ready to attack. Black continues f5 in order to win a pawn. Then Anderson plays a nice move, king d2. It's counterintuitive to move the king like that, but in this position, it's perfectly safe. Now the moves for white play themselves. After knight c6, we see rook g1. Then knight d5 threatening a fork on f6 and limiting the black rook's mobility. Knight d4 attacks the bishop on e2, but now white has a winning sequence. Can you find how white wins? The move Anderson plays is rook takes g7. After it's captured, queen g1, which does exchange queens, but now there is one less piece defending the king, yet the same number of attackers. Now the king has three options. If the king goes towards the center, then white can lure it to e6, where everything is getting forked. King f7 would be similar. So black plays king h8, and the final move in this game is bishop h5. Black resigns. The rook cannot leave the e-file because of bishop e5 checkmate, and its only safe square on the e-file falls directly into a fork. I hope you enjoyed these games, like the video and subscribe for more.